This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Spencer Bruding. I'm Will Johnson. I'm Jessica Knoll. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. I'm Will Johnson. I'm here with Spencer Brudig and Jessica Knoll. I'd like to thank all of our listeners who have joined us this year listening to True Crime Chronicles. We've been doing this for uh, over six months. We are over 25 episodes in. So this week we're doing something special, right, Jessica? Yeah, this week the three of us are going to talk about some of those cases that have really stuck with us for 2019. All right, so our top picks of the first 25 or so episodes, right? Right. I think a lot of the feedback we've been getting is that You can listen to all sorts of true crime podcasts. What we are bringing you and what we will continue to bring you are stories that we find compelling, that we find maybe there is some benefit to us getting the story out there. If it is a closed case, again, it may just be a story that we feel is is worthy of your time and our time. Most of all, we want to bring you not a ton of banter. This week, you're going to hear a little more banter than usual. And I also think that, uh, you know, with a lot of these stories, bringing the voices of the victims to the forefront is super important, whether it's a closed case or a cold case. And in those cold cases, it's also important for you, the listener, if you have any information, it's a call to action for you to do something and and help solve the cases. Enough self-promotion. Let's get into our, our special episode, our gear end episode. Spencer, would you like to go first? What's your top pick for the story that you found that stuck with you the most? Okay, so I think my number one, uh, I'm going to have two overall stories. My number one overall story is Mr. X, actually. Mr. X, the yes. story from Atlanta, Georgia. It was terrifying. You know, I lived out there, I lived out there wanting to die, and I hated the fact that I was out there on the streets away from my children, but when I was about to die, all I could think about is, my God, my kids are going to, they're going to know, they're going to know what I was doing, they're going to know how I died. Very few police departments want to admit that the term exists, much less that they have a serial killer in their city. I can only imagine in 94, 95, 96, the years leading to the 96 Olympics, the stigma associated with having a serial killer here in Atlanta. It is a serial killer. Uh, in Georgia uh, during the Olympics, right? That during the Leading up to the Olympics. Leading, Leading up, up to, to the Olympics. The Olympics. 40, 40 women? It's not what the Atlanta police thought was a serial right. killer. That was the big issue when to, Brendan and I were looking into it. They were trying to kind of downplay they were, the idea they, of serial killer. It was more of, these are just one-offs. This is not connected. These are, um, the women were, a mass majority of the women, the victims, were prostitutes. So that also plays into um, the storytelling because sometimes victims that have a seedier side in their lives are sometimes not looked at as seriously as, say, a child victim or um, someone with a different background. And Jessica, I will say you got to know one of those victims quite well, and you still are in touch with her. I was just going to say that. Go ahead, go ahead. No, please continue. You have kept in touch with Susan Drew after all these years and covering that story, right? Right. She's one of the few victims that survived, and she didn't just survive once. She survived three times. Um, She was on the street as a prostitute, and she was drug addicted in the 90s, and actually up until a couple years ago, um, she had relapsed, but we had kept in touch with her. And she actually, I talked to her very recently. Um, She says the story that Brennan and I did, and then we did this podcast with her also, is what keeps her uh, sober. It's what keeps her motivated to tell her story and to help other victims out there to know that they can overcome not only the struggles from being on the street like she was, but also the demons that she's had to struggle with having been attacked by someone on the street. So this this case, and we actually talk about it a little bit in that episode, is also quite possibly linked to a very well-known serial killer right now in several cities across the country. He's been admitting to killing women back during this time frame. So Samuel Little could be potentially linked to some of these cases. Very likely. Samuel Little also has admitted to not just a few. Oh, no. Isn't he now possibly, the, we keep saying possibly or perhaps, but if, maybe if, the most prolific serial killer? Absolutely, 100%. If he, if all the ones that he's admitted to and continues to admit to, right. he would be the most prolific serial killer in American history. And, and as we, we've now covered a lot of that episode in bits and pieces, but he's actually drawing pictures of his victims from memory in prison. Sort he, of plays into his whole world of being obsessed with his crimes and himself to a degree. And his victims and, and what they look like. And the FBI is... Posting every time he draws a new photo of his victims, they've been posting that on their website. Um, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact number right now of how many it is, but it's a lot. I mean, it's dozens and dozens across the country. And then I do have one more that I want to mention. And then I have two more, but I'll get to those later. Just as many Dark Horse candidates. We only have just, 25 or 26 episodes. I know, but Did they're, you just, they're good. I like them. They're good stuff. Uh, my own personal choice, one of the ones that I did, and it is actually a Will Johnson pitched story. I, I can say that I honestly really like this story because no one died in it. We stepped away from I know what you're the destruction. It's the... Hermit of North Pond, because it is a, it's got a lot of different things that kind of are different from your normal true crime story. It's got this it's mystery. You said it yes. was more of a mystery instead of mystery horror. rather than murder, but it's got a lot of things, right? It's got this kind of, uh, man versus nature. It's got this high adventure element. It's got a person that totally rejected society, totally rejected technology at 20 years old, and then lived through 27 winters, main winters, one of the 
harshest winters in the world. And he did it by stealing from people. It's like there's like the Loch Ness Monster, the Himalayan Yeti, and the North Pond Hermit. There are kids who grew up with hermit stories, now have kids of their own. People did not know what to make of it. There were propane tanks missing, all your National Geographics, your frozen chicken, just no matter what kind of people put better locks on and security systems, but no matter what, there were things stolen. And after more than 25 years, finally a game warden, a local game warden named Terry Hughes, a guy who had been in the Marines for more than a dozen years and then in game warden service for 18 years and lived in the region full-time, so his house was never broken into, said, I'm going to solve this. It's just a really incredible story. And I think if you extract the crime element in this story, there's a lot to him that I feel like you can relate to as far as, I think we would all love to just go off the grid for a week, but to to imagine doing it for that long is exceptional to me. I think the other thing too, I, I think that's interesting to connect to is he rejected technology, he rejected society, but instead of taking it out on others, I mean, he did steal, yes, but a kind of similar vein person is like the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, right? But he decided to, he wanted to return America to this agrarian, you know, uh, break up corporations. And he was kind of a pseudo forward thinking guy with climate change, but he decided to punish other people and, and cause destruction in order to get his uh, message across. While um, the North Pond Hermit, he decided, I'm just going to disappear. You know, I'm going to and steal I'm, things. Yeah, he did steal things. There's crime, of course, but he didn't, he didn't Nothing take it out on his family to. or take it out on society. He, he wanted to try and he didn't leave. physically harm anyone. Right. You know, what struck me the most about that story. And there was a lot to it. And there still is a lot more that we didn't even get to probably, I'm guessing. His place was so well disguised in the woods that no one ever saw it. And he painted the buttons on his jacket, I believe you said. Yeah, even the clothes, the clothesline hangers, green, the clothesline. Were they playing dark, it was like green. army green. And I mean, they had helicopters yeah, flying green. over, right? They had helicopters flying over and they were not able to identify this guy's camp. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So, well, what do you think? What is your top two or three or four? Again, as I look back upon these, I think about all the different stories we talked about covering, the reporters we talked to. And I realized this was actually the first one we, we did, but it came from King in Seattle, the story of Sky Metal Wall, just because it struck me at the time as such an intense and tragic story about a very young child whose mother has this story of parking by the side of the road, leaving her in the car. She goes to get gas. She comes back. Her child is gone. No one ever has been able to figure out what happened to Sky Metal Walla, and the mother has pretty much gone silent on the topic over the years as well. Police say his mother, Julia Buryakova, is still not responding to questions about the case, which started November 6th, when she claimed to leave Sky in a car, which ran out of gas, and then returned to find him missing. But Julia Buryakova, the, the mother of Sky Metawala, the one who said she ran out of gas and, and walked to the gas station, never did an interview, never came out in public and said a thing about this. And, and that was when people, I think, started to get a little bit suspicious. One of the things that really struck me about that one, um, being a mom myself, the idea of not talking to police, not telling them everything you possibly can to find out what happened to your son it just boggles my mind. And and then you have the juxtaposition of the father who is grieving and trying to figure out what happened to his son and there's no answers for him. And I don't know, I don't know necessarily if it's the mother had something to do with it or if she's just a very private person, but so, as someone who has children, I couldn't imagine not doing everything in my power to help people that are trying to find him. And again, if you want to go back and listen to that story, it is our very first episode, Little Sky Gone, and we worked on that with our station King in Seattle. Should I do my other one now? Uh, I would like to hear that. Yes. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm not just picking from the first 12 because you weren't with us yet at the time, Spencer, but uh, wow. the New Obvian story in Georgia, I, I can't get away from. And I, when I talk to people about our show, I often bring up that story, or maybe they've listened to a lot of episodes, and, and they mention that one to me just because kind of like the North Pond Hermit, it's a little different, and it has to do with this cult that moves into Georgia in the, uh, I think, the late 80s and in the 90s. It all came to a head. There's a local sheriff there who um, starts investigating. He is threatened. He is followed. There's a lot to it. But And, and this cult themselves, they're called Nuwabs or Nuwabians, move down from New York. They have a pretty crazy backstory about uh, their leader and their existence in New York, in Brooklyn, I believe it was, before they decided to come down to this very remote part of Georgia. And they build up this giant Egyptian Egypt, theme. Right, I haven't gotten to that part. Sorry. Right, an Egyptian city, a towering, uh, if you want to call it that, but some large structures. Here is this 40-foot high black and gold pyramids, and then you get closer, and there's all kinds of Egyptian deities, statues lining the driveway, and a, a ziggurat, and uh, all this Egyptian paraphernalia, and a big arched gateway with all these Egyptian symbols on it, and, and I'm saying, what the heck is this? The group's leader is identified in literature as Malachi Zodok York. He says that he is from the 8th planet in the 19th galaxy of Iliwon, a universe far outside of this one. Does it make sense to you? We're from Orion. Dr. York is from Risk. He's from, he's from Orion. What's the deal? It's not. It's not strange. It's just new to the public. Are they a cult? Depends on definition of a cult. Certainly, there are, are, are many characteristics similar with other uh, entities that are uh, defined as cult. It gets really dark because of what happens eventually, and, and I'll mention that. But part of the story is that the leader of this cult and then cult members, like every Saturday night, they would have a big party, a dance 
party in the in one of the main Egyptian buildings. And people from Atlanta would come out in droves, I think by the hundreds, maybe even the thousands, um, to, you know, to have fun. Yeah, because wasn't it said, I think in the episode, if I remember correctly, that there were sometimes 5,000 people? Uh, yeah, it was something. It, it was a large number of people. Whatever it was, it was a lot of people to descend upon what was just a plot of land in rural Georgia. And that sheriff comes up again. I believe you're right. Uh, Jessica's covering a story that we will talk about. Sheriff Sills, who, again, in the, the story of the Nuwabians, he investigates them. He Eventually, they, they raid the Nuwabians because it has come to light from uh, different pieces of evidence that they gathered a letter uh, sent from either a, a member or former member about some really dark, awful things that were going on uh, behind closed doors within the confines of that camp, had to do with child abuse, horrific cases of child abuse, actually hundreds reportedly involved, uh, at least as, as victims. Uh, so listen to that episode if you want to hear the full story. I would say as I look back on our 25 episodes, there, I, there are others. I was going to mention the main, the North Pond Herman is one of uh, one of the stories that stuck with me, but those are, those are a few. And just going back a little bit to Sheriff Sills, if you like his no holds bar attitude in the Nuwabians episode, stay tuned and you'll hear more of that determination and dogged attitude, I think, in, in a coming episode uh, about a case that has stumped him for the first time in his career. She had a life and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Hune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is the yellow car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. All right. Well, Jessica, while you have the floor, would you like to tell us your the stories that stuck with you the most? Yeah. So I'm going to actually move ahead a little bit and talk about um, one of my favorite holidays of the year is Halloween. I can't say this is my favorite episode. I will say it's one of the most tragic that I think we've covered um, and has stuck with me because it's just it's unbelievable. Um, the pretend party from Grace White at KHOU. It's a story about Felicia Ruiz, who is lured to a, essentially a fake Halloween party in the middle of this uh, vacant lot by people she thinks are her friends, and and they're not. And the several of the perpetrators were found and charged, but a couple, or is it just one, escaped south of the border? Right. The guy who is believed to or is accused of being the one who orchestrated all of this um, actually fled the country. That's right. Um, there is a social media photo that surfaced that U.S. Marshals have been investigating. He, they've been tracking him down. We actually, in that episode, talked to the U.S. Marshal, who is very close to the family and has been trying to catch this elusive killer for all these years now. Um, and, you know, in talking to him, they might be getting a little closer to solving that for the family. And I remember that one, the parents, just it's heartbreaking to hear the the father, I think, especially is especially vocal about talking about seeing that Facebook picture of someone who is suspected of killing his daughter uh, on a beach, having fun. And not just that, I mean, orchestrating a right. group of people. Right. I mean, in, in, in some of the confessions of the other two, he like told them how to do it, how to hold her down and, and to kill her. And it's it was a brutal attack. And it all stems from them wanting her to join their gang and she didn't want to join. And, you know, I think one of the most heartbreaking parts about it is her parents were so leery about her even going out that night, but she wanted to go to this party so badly. And her dad gave in and said, okay. And she drove away with this this guy who is now... On the run. On the run, yeah. When I seen that picture, I mean, it, it, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it's just like he's sitting there at a beach, having a good time, laughing, like no remorse. It's, I mean, it's heartfelt. I mean, I just it felt, I, I just made him so mad. I just wanted to just reach into that picture and just grab him and just choke him to death. You go to bed with it, you wake up with it. You know, it consumes a lot of your life. And a lot of people say, well, it's 18 years later. Why don't you move on? How do you do that? How the hell do you do that? And, you know, I mean, you, you can't, you can't, because there's a murderer still out there. And that's the last thing we told her before they closed the casket. We, I, to, I bent over and, and, and kissed her and said, Mommy, we are going to get all of these people that hurt you. And we haven't given up since. This is definitely my career case. This is the one that I have emotionally connected to with the family on a level more than any other of my cases before. You mentioned this story uh, came to us from the Houston area and Grace White at KHOU. And I didn't prepare for this to talk about this one, but I'm going to mention it because we also talked to Grace about this, and she did such an amazing job uh, looking into the story previously at KHOU and then also telling us about it was um, the Icebox Murders. And if you remember that one, this case is pretty old. It was over 50 years ago, and it was a couple who were brutally murdered in their house. Turns out that it was their son who was living in the house and went on the run after they were found, parts of their bodies found in the icebox, including a head. Um, and so it's this horrible story that people talk about in Houston still to this day that, you know, sort of part of the folklore, if you will. But it's 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 a true crime story. And the son went on the run 
He ended up dying in, I believe, South America. He had a scientific background. He was talented. He was educated, but he had done this thing back home that was terrible. And he, he died, uh, I believe, in a, in a fight of some type and was never brought to justice. I think that's maybe the oldest case we've oh, looked at the on, the, on yeah. the show so far. Jess, do you have a, another one? Another case for us? So another one that has always stuck with me is also one that's older as well. Um, I think we called it A Stolen Life in Georgia, which to me is always going to be The Doll and the Monster, which is a story that I investigated in Atlanta. Uh, it happened in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, it's about a little girl who was snatched up from the streets uh, in front of witnesses and kidnapped, taken away. Uh, and then she was found some days later in a field. She had been sexually assaulted and murdered. Was anyone ever no. caught? It's yeah. a cold case. In fact, we talked to, in that episode, we talked to the cold case detective in Cobb County in Georgia. And what's interesting about him and that unit is the prosecutor in Cobb County, they got enough funding to open this cold case unit, which are retired law enforcement, detectives, military. There's a, the, the expertise in that group just run the gamut and they all bring something different to the table and they do it on their own time. They're all volunteers. The assault upon Debbie was brutal. It was vicious. It was inhumane. I still think that it's possible to solve this case. It's going to take I guess you'd call it a miracle. It's going to take a huge break, but we've come a long way from where we were. And I do think we have a chance to do this. We did get a DNA profile. So if we can ever match it with someone, game over. I think if there's one thing our show can do, and obviously we, we all hope, you know, there's answers and cold cases can be solved and all of that kind of thing. But if there's one thing we can do in sort of the immediate, it's highlight people who are doing things like that and investigators who are doing things on their own dime, uh, who care enough about something to go out and look for new information that might not have surfaced yet. Well, you got to think, you know, we're doing an episode about the, the the cases that have stuck with us. But for investigators, they've always got those cases that they they go to sleep with, they wake up with. They're always thinking about how they can get the next clue in that case. So it, it drives them. It keeps them moving. And when talking to that detective, Morris Nix, it's something inside them. It's part of, the, you know, it's in their blood to keep hunting. So when they retire, it's not a switch they can flip. This is something that that is very meaningful to them. It almost feels like, you know, it's something you might see in a movie or read about in a book, the detective who can't forget the one crime. But we mentioned the Felicia Ruiz case, the pretend party. And I recall the marshal in that case saying that that was one that he would just never, ever forget. And it makes sense that somebody, you know, you, you finish your career or your job, you're not just clocking off if you've got actual lives, actual people that you have been thinking about for a long time and trying to figure out what happened to them. And I think that's, that's aside from someone giving them that tip to solve it, that's what solves cases like these, is is someone who is so dedicated and passionate about True. getting to the truth and justice. And Sheriff Sills is one of those too. I mean, you know, in, in talking to different detectives and investigators, that's, I think, what, you know, that d drives these cases. We've heard stories that have included parents who are still out there and who don't want to have to go on the nightly news and talk about the fact that their daughter or their son or their loved one vanished and didn't come back, but they know they have to do it and they make it their job to go on the nightly news and talk about it or talk to us. Yeah, because he keeping it in the public eye and bringing awareness is so important to these cases. And most of those detectives will tell you that it's helpful to keep putting them out there because it only takes that one person who knows something to be compelled by listening. And I think we did that you know, I'm going to kind of switch gears for a second and and talk about Bardstown, which is another podcast Vault Studios produced. But that's what's going to solve some of those cases, too, is that one person or those people who know something. Because someone in any of these cold cases that we've talked about, someone knows something if they're still alive. And it's just a matter of them coming forward and telling the right person to get justice. All right. If we're not careful, we are going to mention almost all the cases we've covered. But suffice to say, we have a lot more to cover in 2020. We do this because we care about these cases. We care about telling you about these cases. We know you're interested. And at this point, I think there's, you know, as you're still traveling and getting home from the holidays, there's plenty that you can binge through uh, for this year and moving into 2020, having more we have something pretty special coming up. A brand new podcast from Vault Studios. Uh, it's called The Officer's Wife, and it will be launching in mid-January. So, so you'll be hearing much more about The Officer's Wife in coming weeks. And of course, if you like this show, it would uh, really help us out if you would give us a like and a subscribe, tell your friends and family, and uh, please review us on whatever uh, platform you're listening to this show on. And if you like our discussion here, you're going to love our Facebook group, Inside the Crime Vault, where you can discuss with us these cases and some others that you think we should start looking into for 2020. So next week, we'll be back with a new case and a new story, and we promise much less banter. Yeah. Much, much less.